Okay, so chapter three, right? Chapter three, uh, Philippians. Um, let's read a few verses. Uh, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, uh, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted laws for Christ. Yes, yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Okay, so he starts by saying, you know, my brethren rejoice in the Lord. Okay, so if you uh, see this, he, he, he says this uh, a few times, right? He, um, uh, I think we, we see, in uh, chapter one, also, right? Chapter one, also, he he talks about uh, uh, how how he will rejoice. Right? Chapter one, verse eighteen, says uh, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, uh, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice and will rejoice, right? And uh, he talks about uh, uh, in chapter two. Just now, we we read. You know, uh, he's saying, for the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Okay, so he's talking about how, you know, uh, he's being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of their faith. And he's saying, I'm, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. For this reason, you also be glad and you rejoice. So here in chapter three, also, he's talking about rejoicing. It's a, it's a wonderful that um, to that we we can learn something from you know from Paul uh, from his whole outlook towards life outlook towards ministry and uh, you know he's saying rejoice in the Lord and rejoice in the Lord and he's talking to those people who are even though he's a prisoner he's saying rejoice rejoice in the Lord so which means that rejoicing in the Lord or joy uh, that for us to have the joy, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, um, you know, which we read in Galatians 5.22, um, it doesn't have to depend on our circumstance, right? our physical circumstance. Uh, it doesn't have to have, you know, it, it, it need not be, okay, I have these things and therefore I will rejoice, or um, everything is going fine, therefore I will rejoice. You know, it doesn't have to be that way at all. Right? It's very clear that Paul, so many times he writes in this, you know, what is called as a prison epistle. He writes it and he says, you know, you rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. I rejoice. Right? And so he says, rejoice in the Lord. Okay? Uh, and again, we, we know that he will say that in chapter 4 also. You know, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I will say, you know, rejoice. Okay, so um, definitely, it's the work of the spirit in one's life which causes a person to rejoice, and also, you know, our perspective, you know, uh, of a higher reality, you know, our grasp of a higher reality, that is, our grasp of the spiritual reality, knowing that okay, here are certain things that are eternal, and here are certain things that are temporal. 
okay now if my grasp if my grip on the things that are spiritual or the eternal things if 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 i'm going to have that uh, before me at all times then i'm i will be able to rejoice but if it's going to be on the temporal and my focus is there on the things that are you know always on the things that are carnal then i will not be able to rejoice right so saying rejoice in the lord um verse one for me to write the same things to you is not tedious but for you it is safe okay so i'm writing the same things over and over again and and he's going to talk about what is it that he's writing you know what is it that he's repeating right so you know as a teacher as an apostle you know as one who's laying down doctrine um you know one of the things of teaching is repetition right uh, like you a teacher i'm sure the way we learned our alphabets and the, the way we learned some of these things is through repeating you know, multiplication tables in maths um you know we repeated over and over again and with the intention of learning understanding uh we you know memorizing so that it will remain with us we repeated it over and over again so um so as a teacher he is repeating certain things and uh, paul says you know for me it is not tedious it's not tiresome right uh it, in fact uh for you it is safe <laughs> i'm sorry in the, for the simple reason that uh, you will understand it you will get to uh these things will remain with you so he uses the word you know for you it is safe right uh, literally it means uh, it's secure so you feel you are secure you will be certain uh, when these truths are repeated over and over again okay so so he's writing the same things he's not afraid of writing the same things he's not afraid of repeating the same things um because you know repetition means okay here are some things to be reiterated right these are important things so i'm i'm going to you know say it once more so in case you didn't uh you don't you didn't understand it earlier or in case you missed it the earlier time um now you have another chance another opportunity to understand it and also to receive it right so so he's saying uh yeah it is good it is for you it is safe for you it is something that is that will make you secure and certain so i'm repeating it okay um so what does he say what are the some things that he's repeating you know, verse 2 beware of dogs beware of evil workers beware of the mutilation so he's is uh, the word beware means uh, be aware uh, and uh, and it also means be alert right discern be careful Okay, so it means uh, observe, discover, understand. So, um, you know, if there is anything uh, worth, uh, you know, if there's any danger, right, it's worth that you, you know, keep yourself safe. Right? So, so he's saying beware of these things. So he's listing down beware of, uh, you know, certain things that he, that we need to be aware of be careful of right um discern so he's saying what are those things he's saying beware of dogs obviously he's not referring to the animals but he's referring to he's using a word which the jews used to refer used to use you know you jews still used uh, at those times to refer to people who were non-jews and they used it in a very derogatory term right you remember the, the syrophoenician woman who went to ask the lord uh lord you know heal uh you know i'm healing uh oh, sorry uh, she she was, she went there on behalf of her daughter and uh and the lord says you know it is uh it is not good to uh take what the children's bread and give it to the dogs and uh he, he she knew what he was referring to and uh and the lord used that term there and uh, she went on to say okay but even the little dogs you know the pets that you keep at home even they eat crumbs that fall from the table and the lord commended her faith okay but the word term dogs was used very disrespectfully by the jews against the non-jews because they 
looked at themselves as someone far superior because they had the law uh, which was given to them by God and God was interacting with them and through them would come the Messiah and, and etc. So all the non-Jews or the Gentiles were you know, sometimes uh, uh, referred to disrespectfully as dogs. Now, Paul is using that same word and he's saying, you beware of dogs. So what is he referring to? And is he referring to Gentiles? He's actually writing to the Gentile church, right? non-Jewish church. So who is he referring to? So he's referring to, you know, when we read the rest of the verse and the next verse, we, we understand. So he's saying, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. You know, he's, so he's referring to people who were teaching, uh, he was referring to people like, uh, he was referring to the Jewish teachers or Judaizers who were, traveling, uh, visiting um, th those who had put their faith in Christ, right? uh, Gentile churches, and they were teaching them that they needed to be circumcised. You know, something that we see in Galatians also. Right? Uh, false brethren, whom Paul refers them to as, you know, they were going around teaching, uh, meeting with non-Jewish people who had put their faith in Jesus and saying, you need to be circumcised in order to be born again. You need to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Right? So he's saying, beware of those evil workers, beware of the mutilation. Mutilation, mutilate means to cut away something. He was he's, you know, referring to the circumcision um, which they were teaching, you know, which they were saying you need to be circumcised. So beware of the mutilation. And then verse three, we are the circumcision. Right. So he's referring to uh, uh, certain, you know, uh, what uh, even in the Old Testament in Jeremiah, where uh, uh, Jeremiah, I think it's, yeah, let's look at Jeremiah 4 and verse 4. Okay, Jeremiah 4, verse 4. It says, uh, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and so on. So what is, uh, you know, is here, circumcision is something to do with the heart, which we see in um, the book of Romans also. Like, uh, uh, let me just get read that verse. Um, uh, Romans 5, I think. Yeah, sorry, Romans 2 and uh, verse 25. Okay, Romans chapter 2 and uh, verse 25. So for circumcision is indeed profitable. Okay, now just skip a few verses here. Uh, verse 28, okay. Romans chapter 2 and verse 20, 28. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter whose praise is not from men, but from God. So here he's saying, you know, it's, it's something to do with the heart. It's something to do with what the internal change. So that is, um, you know, circumcision is, is that. Um, so, so here he's saying, you know, we are the circumcision. You know, we are the ones who have had an internal change, a change of heart. You know, we've had a transformation because of our faith in the Lord Jesus. So we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Right Now that's the conversation that the Lord Jesus had with the woman at the well. Right? John chapter 4, 23, 24. That God is spirit. That those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So he says here, Paul is saying, you know, um, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. We've worshiped, we've had a change of heart. You know, our spirits are born again. Now, when we worship God, our spirit worship, we worships, you know, we worship from our spirit. We worship as led by the Holy Spirit. So we are the ones, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. 
okay so rejoice in christ jesus again he says you know rejoice rejoice in the lord rejoice in christ christ jesus have no confidence in the flesh meaning that all these outward forms <coughs> excuse me all these outward forms all these uh, you know the circumcision and keeping of certain time and day and traditions don't put your confidence in that now that is you know that is not going to uh, alter anything or be beneficial to you in the spirit right so have do not put your confidence or your trust or rely in those things okay let your trust and confidence and reliance not be on the things of the flesh put no confidence in the flesh okay so saying you know if anyone you know uh, that's what we see right uh, verse verse 4 yeah. though i also may have confidence in the flesh if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh i more so so he's talking about you know all the outward forms and all the outward uh, rituals and everything that he did or he held on to as a pharisee right before coming to jesus right so he's saying you know have put no confidence in the flesh so if anyone were to have confidence in the flesh you know it would be me because of all the things that i very diligently kept and the things that i did Okay, all the traditions and everything. So he goes on to explain, okay, what is it? Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. So he's, he's referring to his lineage. You know, I was from this tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee. You know, so we know that he was training under Gamaliel um, as, a, as a Pharisee, to be a Pharisee. So he was very the strictest sect right he was being trained uh, to be a pharisee and he was a pharisee he had you know undergone that training so verse 6 concerning zeal you know his zeal for his teachings and zeal for uh, you know when it come when it came to being a pharisee well he was very zealous he thought that this these believers these people who are putting their faith in jesus were against the were actually blaspheming the law so in his mind you know they were doing the wrong thing and they needed to be punished and so concerning zeal his enthusiasm for his religion he was very zealous he persecuted the church right he went ahead and he arrested people, threw them into prison, got letters of permission from the, um, you know, from the scribe, um, from the Pharisees and from the high priest and um, Sanhedrin, and he went around persecuting. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. According to the law, he did everything. You know, he tried not to miss anything. So he's saying with confidence that concerning the law, he was blameless. Well, this is what the law prescribed, Paul would do it. It said, don't do this, he will not do it. So concerning the law, he was righteous. He did everything, every formula, every, every tradition, he would, he would do that. So according to the law, he was blameless. Then verse 7, but what things were gained to me, you know, all these, keeping all these traditions and all these trainings as a Pharisee and all these, you know, learnings that he had had, what things were gained to me says these i count as loss okay, loss for the sake of christ so what, whatever things were gained to me whatever things were you know advantages uh, you know, to me at that point right as a pharisee um, advantage you know maybe influence uh, maybe the the kind of authority, the kind of position that he had, the pride that he had in, in, in as, as one who kept the law, whatever things uh, were gained to me, these I count as loss or damage or something that is a waste. These I counted loss for Christ. 
right? So here he's saying, you know, yeah, yeah, I count all things in verse eight. eight. Indeed, I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Okay, so here he uses another word uh, uh, to say that I count. Uh, sorry, yeah, I'm sorry, he uses the same word loss, <coughs> and he says for the excellence of the uh, knowledge of Christ. So all these things are compared to, you know, when I compare them, I I find that these are, you know, th these are not worthy, worthy even to be compared with the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. You know, knowledge of Christ su far superseded all that. Right? Far superseded all that. It, was, it is, can't even be compared. It was excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Right. So saying, you know, this is this is how I was, and uh, that this is how I've come to be, right? and the, the knowledge of Christ, the personal uh, experience, the salvation that he experienced in Christ. There's nothing compared to that. All the other things are literally nothing. And and the word used there, you know, I count them as loss. Um, and he says, I suffered the laws of all things and count them as rubbish. Okay, and uh, and the word that he uses there again is uh, it means uh, it is it is ex ex excreta, you know, or dung, you know, ex uh, dung, which is uh, the waste of animals. Like the dung of animals, the excrement of animals, you know, he uses a very strong word, you know, he says that is what it is compared to the knowledge of Christ. So you see, you know, two different things. And and, and this is Paul who had, you know, who had undergone a lot of training and zealous for the things of, you know, the, the law and everything. And he's saying, you know, this is what it is. It is, it is actually rubbish. Right. It is filth. It is uh, worthless. It is. Uh, it is. It is like an animal excretion. It's like dung. Right. For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. So, this is how our knowledge of Christ is. It is. It, it is wonderful. It's excellent. Right. Um, excellency, which means something that is uh, st something that stands out, something that is superior something that is wonderful okay so it is much 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 superior wonderful and beautiful and quality uh, superior uh, excellent it, it you know there's no comparison right so he's saying uh, i call i count this as rubbish for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. So he sees a clear difference, you know, the transformation and the and the uh, and the uh, the knowledge of Christ, and uh, you know, he just sees that as something that is as something worthy of excellence, right? So, so verse nine says, um, and uh, sorry, verse eight also says, says for the for the cause of Christ, or for the because of the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. I have suffered the loss of all these things, right? Whatever, uh, whatever he might have gained, whatever reputation he might have gained as someone, uh, whatever standing he had in society, uh, whatever influence that he had you know, as a Pharisee, you know, I've, I've suffered the loss of all these things, and in fact, he was being persecuted, and right? he was persecuted for the faith. He was being hunted down, um, put in prison. For the sake of Christ, and, and he was writing from prison, so he was, you know, he was writing from experience. So he says, "I have suffered the loss of all things for the sake of for the sake of the knowledge of Christ, and uh, and count them as rubbish, count them as even dung, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that." He's saying, talking about, you know, that be found in him with that righteousness which comes from faith. So, well, saying, you know, there is this righteousness which 
which is from the law in the sense, okay, I've done everything right, uh, all the works that I've done, and therefore, you know, I can count myself as, you know, according to the law, well, I am righteous. Okay, and uh, maybe when you check and see, you can see that, okay, I have some sense of, uh, you know, righteousness because of the law. But that's nothing. So, uh, you know, and be found in Christ. You know, this is what I want, that I may gain Christ and be found in Christ with the righteousness that comes from my faith in the Lord Jesus. Because of my faith in the Lord Jesus, he imputes his righteousness upon me. He gives his righteousness. I get, I'm covered by his righteousness. And I want, you know, that I may be found by him having this righteousness because of my faith in Christ, which is from God by faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Okay, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And, and he goes on to, you know, talk about a few things as well. And the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. So he's talking about, I may know him, that I may know the power of his resurrection, that I may know the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Okay, so um, the power of his, that I may know him, first of all, you know, saying that you know, he's, he's already, uh, it's not that he does not know Christ, but he wants to know more of him, right? He wants to know more of him. He wants to have this experiential knowledge of him. And the word, the Greek word he uses is gnosko, which means to, you know, I want to uh, have an experiential knowledge. I want to be intimate. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, intimate with the Lord. I want to know his heart. And I, don't, I, just, I just want to go beyond this head knowledge. It's not head knowledge anymore, but it's heart knowledge. You know? I want to have a heart understanding. I want to experience an experiential knowledge. I really want to know him. It, it's, it's not information about him or knowledge about God or knowledge about certain things, right? So he has experienced. He has uh, experienced Jesus. He has heard his voice. Uh, you know, the Lord has come and he has, he has led him. He had spoken to him. And, um, and ministry also, he's, he's experienced his power, being filled with the Spirit and, and all that. So he says, you know, I want to know him more. Oh, that I may know him, that I may know Christ, that I may, you know, hear his voice, experience more of him, experience his touch, his love, his grace, his favor, right? So all that, that I may know him. So he's saying, more than I know now, more than I know him now. Right? I want to be closer. I want to have a closer walk. See, you know, the passion for the presence of the Lord, right? So <clears throat> it's not just, okay, I'm doing ministry in this place. So many people have come to know the Lord. Um, you know, I'm, you know, taking pride in those things. It's not that at all. So he's saying that I may know him. Okay, at the end of it all, this is what matters, that I may know him. Right? So, so Paul was... He talks about the kind of effort that he put in ministry. He says, you know, I labored more than them all because yet I know this is the grace of God. The grace of God enabled me to work more, uh, you know, uh, do more uh, and everything, right? So it's not that he he was just sitting around uh, saying, I want to know Christ. No, he, he did his work. He, he was moved by the grace of God. He was moved by the compassion of God. And he went about you know, ministering in signs, wonders, miracles. Like, so we, we know he did all this by the power of the Lord Jesus, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet he says that, you know, that I may know him, that I may know him more than I know him now. That I may hear his voice, that I may experience more about Jesus. Okay, so that, um, that I may know him, verse 10, and the power of his resurrection. So he's talking about the presence of God, the person of the Lord Jesus, and the power of the Lord. Right? Paul never shied away from letting people know that 
you need to pursue the power of the Lord Jesus and the power of God, the miraculous, supernatural, miracle working, uh, you know, raw power of God. There's, you know, it goes where it goes with the presence of God. It goes with the person, knowing the person of the Lord. So Paul never held himself back. In fact, he urged people. He, uh, he, you know, in all his teachings, and you know, he urged people to go pursue the presence and the power of God. Like, how do we know that? We, when we, you know, one of the places we see is, of course, here we see this, and uh, about his own you know, pursuit. And, and of course, he says, be imitators, you imitate me as I imitate Christ. So we know that you know, all that he's doing, he's, he's asking people, you know, he's leading by example and asking people to follow uh, the example that he's setting before them. Uh, and also we see, you know, in 1 Corinthians 14, right, we see that he's saying, okay, uh, pursue love, desire, spiritual gifts the spiritual gifts are expression of the power of the holy spirit right the, the power of the holy spirit is expressed through the gifts of the holy spirit so he's saying desire spiritual gifts pursue love the love of god which he spoke about in chapter 13 the agape the unconditional love of god so pursue love and desire you know, desire we've seen the word you know, the intensity go after, pursue, crave for the power. So here also we see that, oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the Holy Spirit uh, resurrection power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. That he says, you know, that I, I want to know more about that. I want to, ex I want to have an experiential knowledge about that. Not just read about it, not just talk about it, but I want to experience it. Right? Okay. And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. So, which means that, uh, you know, part of following Jesus, um, well, the sufferings for the sake of Christ is also part of it. Right? And uh, like we studied in 2 Corinthians, we see uh, the, all the, you know, the difficulties and the travel, the persecutions. He, uh, like he talks about that, right? Let's me, let me just quickly uh, read that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, if you see, you know, he, he writes, um, verse 23 onwards, he says, uh, you know, in labors more abundant, in stripes about measure, above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. And then he writes about, you know, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in the wilderness, in the sea, among false brethren, Weariness and toil and sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, in fastings, often in cold and nakedness, and uh, you know he lists down all these things, and he says, you know, this is this has been my experience in ministry, right? I undergo this. So he's saying, you know, oh that I might know him, the power of his resurrection, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, like being conformed to his death okay that i might know the fellowship of his sufferings that i might have a you know communion of the kind of sufferings that you know that that goes along with it for the sake of christ and being conformed to his death meaning you know, that's the triumphant one that is being triumphant right uh, because his death actually spoke triumph over everything over the uh, works of satan over the works of the flesh um, his work spoke triumph. His death spoke triumph, declared victory. So he's saying, be conformed to his death. Like if you read uh, Romans chapter 6, right? knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Romans 6, verse 6. Um, and maybe, maybe we, if we can look at verse 5 also. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, 
certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So who wrote these words? Paul. Right? So he knows that being conformed to his death, meaning that it is uh, being conformed to all that he died to and being alive that all he's, uh, he's you know, uh, being resurrected and being alive in all that he's alive to. So saying, saying, you know, he says in verse six, knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to. He lives to God. Right? Uh, so he's talking about you know this victory over sin. He's talking about this, you know, this victory over Satan and sin and so on. So he's saying, you know, um, this thing, the, the victory over the flesh. So saying um, that I may also have that know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed. Okay, uh, so, you know, being conformed, being fit into the pattern, right? being conformed, fitting in, right? Um, perfectly being conformed to the uh, to his death if by any means i may attain to the resurrection from the dead okay so that's 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 a way of saying that you know it's not like he's doubting the resurrection from the dead that he's saying that i want to be conformed to the death of jesus that you know when there's a resurrection that i will be conformed to that as well right that i will attain that as well so um so that's verse 11 okay so now let's look at uh, verse 12 onwards so not that i have already attained all am already perfected but i press on i press on okay that i may lay hold of that for which christ jesus has also laid hold of me brethren I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Okay. So verse 12 is, is just saying, okay, not that I have already attained. Okay, not that I have already reached a place of fully mature. Right? Not that I've already reached you know, being perfected. Now, when we say, you know, being perfected, he says, you know, um, I don't count myself to have, um, uh, to have apprehended. <coughs> Verse 12, he says, not that, no, or I'm already perfected. So, so one of the things uh, we need to understand is that this perfection that he's talking about is, uh, is, uh, is not the standing that we have in Christ. It's not, you know, he's not talking about being justified, justified, right? Because we read in Hebrews that by one sacrifice, uh, what do we read then, right? Um, 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 yeah, he, he offered one sacrifice. Okay, we, we, I'm looking at Hebrews 10 and uh, verse uh, 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. I'm just skipping down to verse 14. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Okay, see, see the words there. For by one offering, what has he done? He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Okay, so... 
that's something we need to understand that we are perfected forever but we are being sanctified there's something that is happening that is something that has already been done okay so that is hebrews 10 and um, verse 14 okay so so if you look at that you know by one offering one sacrifice he has perfected okay matured accomplished completely brought to uh, a, a, a finished state a perfect state there's nothing more to be done but at the same time these are being consecrated or set apart or made holy separated okay now both both is it's a reality for both but it's talking about two different things here you are being perfected i mean you are perfected but you are being sanctified as believers we are perfected we are made perfect by that one offering by that one sacrifice but we are being sanctified there's an ongoing sanctification that is happening okay so that is what he's referring to you know when he's saying not that i've already been made perfect okay so he's talking about how uh, we are being sanctified that he is also being um, you know sanctified so um, so he's saying that uh, not that I'm already perfected. He's talking about the work of sanctification or consecration that is that is already, you know, that is continuing, that is happening in his life. Um, that he's not already attained. Again, he's talking about that. You know, I've not reached that place. I've not reached that place of, uh, you know, completion yet. Okay. Um, so I've not reached that place. But what does he do? But I press on. I follow after. And I pursue. I press on. <coughs> Which means to, to go swiftly, to pursue intently. Uh, it's, it's the picture of uh, one, one who is running a race, who's running, running towards the goal. So he's saying, you know, I press on. I run towards the goal. I pursue the goal. Okay. And how does he do that? Right? In what way does he do that? He says, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. So I may lay hold of that. You know, that the very reason for which the, the Lord Jesus has, has actually captured me or he has laid hold of me. He has, he has, you know, he has, he has held me. Right? Um, he has, he has, uh, is apprehended or he has uh, he has captured me literally so he's saying you know i press on that i may lay hold of that for which christ jesus also has laid uh, hold of me okay um so that is uh, 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 that is something that he's saying you know i've been captured by christ i've been lay hold of uh, and uh, for all those reasons for which he he seized me. He took possession of me. Right? For all those reasons, I need to lay hold of that. You know, I need to have a strong goal. I need to have a strong hold. Sorry. So I press on. I pursue, and I that I may lay hold of that. Okay. What are those things? What is the 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 things that are freely given? The things that that God is you know extending to me. Uh, maybe the the revelations, the gifts, the outpouring of the spirit, everything. I want to lay hold of that. I want to have a strong grip on that, a firm grip on that. Like uh, you know, he's saying, I, I don't, I don't want to let lose out on that, right? So uh, that I may hold on to that strongly. I may obtain it, appropriate it have a strong grip of it so which means that you know paul says this you know you work walk worthy of the lord in uh, in the previous uh, uh, chapter we, we see that you know he's saying um, walk worthy of the lord and this is uh, sorry in, in, yeah i think it was in chapter one let your conduct 
conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And he's reminding that, that this is one way of walking worthy, that you don't lose your grip on things for which Christ has laid hold of you. The way, you know, he has actually pursued you. He has, you know, you have made your commitment to the Lord and he's holding you. And there are things that he has extended to you. He has put in your life. Uh, he has put in your spirit. So don't lose out on that. I don't have a, I don't be negligent of that. Don't lose your grip on that. Lay hold of that tightly because for this reason, he actually has laid hold of you. That you might have hope, that you might have comfort, that you might have um, a future, um, that you might walk worthy of him. Whatever calling, gifting, you know, uh, the way he has placed you in the body of Christ, all that he's putting in your life, the calling for ministry, everything. Have a firm grip on that. Don't lose that. Don't be distracted. Don't lose your focus. Don't fall by the wayside. Oh, I'm going to press on, he says. You know, I've not reached that level yet, but I'm pressing on and I'm so that I may have a strong grip of all these things. Okay, verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, no, I don't count myself or I don't consider myself to have apprehended. Okay, that's verse 13, right? Uh, I, I don't count myself to have already, you know, the same thing, you know, just like how, uh, you know, not that I've already attained, he says, uh, I don't count myself to have already apprehended those things. Okay, but... This is one thing that I do. This is one thing that I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. I reach out. Right? I reach forward to those things which are ahead of me. And that, and that is a very, very important lesson for us. Right? So the things that are behind could be regrets and failures it could be accomplishments also right it could be the high points of our lives it could be the low points of our lives it could be things that we are proud of it could be things that we are not proud of okay. so here he's saying if i need to lay hold of that if i need to keep going forward if i need to fulfill things that god has for me then i need to do this Right. He's saying, he's giving us a key for this. He's saying, uh, you know, uh, an answer uh, for some of those things. So he's saying, you know, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Now, these things have happened in the past. It could be good, bad, whatever. I might have accomplished certain things. I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to just stay there. I'm not going to stay there, but I'm, I'm going to move forward. Right. Sometimes... Some of those good things that have happened to us, you know, we, we just keep thinking about them over and over again. Nothing wrong. We give praise to God. Uh, nothing wrong. We need to testify, yes, but we need to move on. Reach forward to those things that are ahead. And in verse 14, he says, I press towards the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, I'm not forgetting my ministry. I'm not forgetting my purpose, the call of God, I go forward. Okay, there's work to be done. There's things to be accomplished. And uh, it involves the call of God. It's not come to an end yet. So forgetting those things that are behind, I press forward. I move forward. Okay, so this is verse 14. Okay, so let's uh, stop here. And then we will uh, continue in the next class. Okay, so till Philippians 3 and verse 14. You know, we've, we've come here. We'll stop here. Okay. Thank you.